Good evening, everybody. Let's take our songbooks to page number 127. Jesus loves even me. Page number 127. Page number 127. Page number 127. I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of His love in the book He has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the nearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Number 269 in the garden. Number 269. Number 269. I come to the garden alone. Despite us, despite us, and we thank you for saving us from our sins, paying our penalty that we could not pay. We just pray that you'll be with us this night, be with the speaker, give them the words to say, and just pay your Holy Spirit come down among us tonight. And we just thank you for all you do. 
for us. We give you all the praise and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, folks, to church tonight. that bright and cheerful music amen that kind of brightens your day up brother josh is going to come preach for us tonight and then we'll have prayer meeting kind of have in mind your prayer request tonight and have them ready and we'll get right into that when he's done preaching and let's encourage him and help him preach tonight brother josh amen, amen. i come in fear and trembling tonight been nervous, been thinking about this message for a couple of weeks and nervous about it and fear and trembling. How many of you think a preacher ought to have some fear and trembling when he brings the word? You raise your hand. How many of you think a pastor ought to have some fear and trembling whenever he's preaching? Raise your hand. How many of you think you ought to have a little fear and trembling when you hear the message the pastor was fearing and trembling to bring? That's where it all changes, doesn't it? We think the pastor should be trembling, but we think we just get to sit there and eat our popsicles and watch the show and don't have to really listen. Um, we've The last couple times the Lord's had us, He's given me some messages on, um, we have the threefold core of the Great Commission, things like that. And we talked about preaching, how long is too long. We talked about how God's ordained preaching. The Lord's given me a, me uh, given me a message today on authority. Authority must be derived from a higher authority. We'll get to Scripture here in just a little bit. Um, authority must be derived from a higher authority. In the um, United States of America, we have the idea authority is derived from the consent of the governed. And that's not really biblical. Authority comes from God. End of story. If authority doesn't come from God, it's not authority. There's no authority. You can't, make enough, you can't get enough people together to make up your little authority structure to make it valid if God didn't ordain it. Authority is from God or it's not authority. And God gave us three basic jurisdictions, the family, government, and the church. He ordained the family and Genesis there whenever he created one man and one woman. And um, he gave them a job to do. When Eve was deceived, she was in the transgression, the Bible says. So she's not to be the head of the home. The man is. Amen? 
How many of you agree with that? I, I believe that tonight. Praise the Lord. There's not a whole lot of people left that believe that, but that's God's word. That's what it says. So God ordained the home and he ordained the man to be the representative head of to God for the home, the priest of the home. That's God's ordained authority structure. Then God ordained government in Genesis chapter 9. He said, if a man kills a man by the hand of man, shall his blood be shed. And so God gave man the right and, and the responsibility to kill murderers. And with that, to uphold God's law, not man's law. God's law, to uphold God's law. God never gave man authority for arbitrary law. There's no, that doesn't exist, you, okay? This, this idea that we can just come together and as our unity makes it right, that's all a lie from the devil. The Word of God is what determines what's right and wrong. And God ordained human government. And when God ordained human government, He ordained human government to keep the peace according to the law. Now, then the third one would be the church. Now, if we could have, and we will pray, we'll get to scripture and we'll pray here in just a second. I need a, a young family, somebody real quick, somebody volunteer, young family, a dad, a mom, a baby at least. Anybody? Nobody wants to volunteer for this. Come on, somebody. All right, Michael's coming. All right, Michael, come on up here. Um, Weston, would you come represent the church, please? Pick on you because you're young. Are you here tonight? Weston, come on up quick. And Gary Coop, are you here? I wanted you for this one. I want you to represent um, government because he was a sheriff. I don't see him here tonight. Gabe, you stand in for him? All right, come on up here. So, um, Weston, you go over there by that uh, um, by the Christian flag. Gabe, you come over here by the American flag. So we have these three God-ordained government systems. So now let's say Gabe here decides that he's going to arbitrarily make a law that usurps Michael's God-given jurisdiction as the head of his home. And he comes to usurp Michael's authority. Is that right? No. Is he allowed to do that? No. Is Michael allowed to come and usurp Weston's jurisdiction if he is, say, a pastor, can Michael come and usurp his jurisdiction? Well, now that one we kind of stumble on. Can Michael usurp, can Weston usurp Michael's? No. These, these authorities given by God are equal authorities, okay? They're not one greater than the other, but they have separate jurisdictions. And those jurisdictions overlap. And each of these jurisdictional heads has to be careful how they work together. Just because Gabe's a police officer, let's say, and your dad, right? He can't come into the church house and grab Weston by the back of the neck for preaching out of King James Bible. That's not legal. I don't care what Senate does. I don't care what the House of Representatives passes. It's not legal. It's not right. It's illegal. It's tyranny. And we don't have to obey that law. How many of you believe that? You know, the whole foundation of the United States of America was based on this concept. This is why we have a free nation, because our people understood authority and jurisdiction. And they realized that when now Gabe gets to be King George, now when King George, was George right? Anyway, so when he comes over here and says, Michael, give me your gun, Michael has the responsibility from God to defend his family. And he does not have to obey the law of the, the king did. So there's this clash between authorities. And then whenever he goes after Weston, and there was this clash between authority and jurisdiction. Go ahead and sit down. Thank you. I appreciate your cooperation. And that clash between jurisdictions of authorities ended up in what's known as the Revolutionary War. The American people did not rebel against England. What they did was they appealed to an authority that was overstepping his jurisdictional bound. When he would not hear reason, they said, you are disqualified. You are breaking God's law. You have no right to rule over us anymore. We will be governed by God and by law. They did not rebel. It was not lawless. It was not some kind of French revolution. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. They submitted to the laws of God. That's why God honored the United States of America and God won the war for America. And if you don't know that, you don't know. You just don't know nothing about it. If you don't know that God formed this country, you don't know American history. But we've got to move on. We're not talking about American history right now. But the reason God did that is because of jurisdictional authority. 
because there was an authority usurping his jurisdiction and God honored the other authorities who acted in accordance with his word as they protected their jurisdictions. We'll get, let's just pray. We'll get, we're going to get to scripture. If we, man, time flies. Father, in Jesus' name, help us tonight. Help me to preach. Help us to get to what we need to get to. Help me to leave everything else out. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if jurisdictions overlap, great care must be taken by all representative heads of those jurisdictions. First of all, not to infringe on the other authorities' jurisdictions. Secondly, to defend their own jurisdiction. It is sin against God for an authority to allow his jurisdiction to be infringed on without defending it in whatever capacity he can. How many of you believe that? It is a sin for a king to let another king come in and kill and rape and pillage and murder in his kingdom. And it's a sin for you not to defend your family when a murderer comes in and tries to kill your family. God has given you, fathers, the job to defend your family. It would be a sin, a sin to sit there and let that murderer do whatever he wanted to do. And you say, wait, didn't Jesus say turn the other cheek? But what about the time he got the whip out? How are you going to reconcile this stuff? It all goes back to authority and jurisdiction. It all goes back to the authority and the jurisdiction. Now, failure to govern your God-given jurisdiction biblically is dereliction of duty. It is sin. This is why states threw off tyrannical yoke of English overreach. This is why God defeated the British. God works through authority. So for a government to defy God, allow murder, that's... Wicked for a father to abdicate his responsibility to train up his children in the way they should go and turn them loose to the government schools is sin. For a pastor to allow sin to just run through the church and not do anything to stop it is sin. All across this country, it's happening everywhere, and pastors think they have the right to just let it go. They don't. If you're a pastor, you have the job to protect the flock as much as to feed the flock. God says, warn, rebuke, exhort, reprove, feed, teach, mark them that are unruly among you. Avoid some. So we see a daddy is to be obeyed in the Lord. A government is to be obeyed in the Lord. But you know a pastor is to be obeyed in the Lord. Say, so where are you going with this? Well, we're going to get there here in just a second. Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 15. This is a fearful subject. I'm not talking about bad pastors today. It might sound like that for a second, but I'm not. You know, a renegade daddy has to be removed, doesn't he? If he won't obey God's law, he's abusing, literally abusing his children according to God's word. He's got to be removed. A renegade government must be overthrown by its people, whether the CIA is listening or not. That's, the people should overthrow a renegade government that's defying God's law. A pastor that won't obey the Bible, there are biblical ways to deal with that pastor and remove him. We're not talking about that today. So if if we can see all of this in all these represent in all these authorities, why can't we see that the representative head of Christ in the church is to be obeyed? Is to be obeyed. Hebrews says, "Obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. Obey them that have the rule over you." I am not a pastor, so I'm, this is a strange direction to preach it from. I might have an advantage not being a pastor preaching this because I have to be under authority too in this regard. So Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul was a king. That is a different jurisdiction than church. And Samuel was a prophet of God. And the Bible talks about the church in the wilderness. So by extension, you can see, though it was not the New Testament church, you can see that you had two authorities. You had Saul over the government. You had Samuel over the church in the wilderness, so to speak. And Samuel gave Saul a commandment by the word of the Lord. Saul didn't see it that way. Saul edited it. Saul kind of left some things out and halfway followed the instructions. 
instructions. And God said through Samuel, because you have, thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. God removed a head of another jurisdiction because he would not listen to the man of God. That is serious. That is serious. Why can't we get this today? The pastor, by God, must give account for your soul. Pastoral abuses will be punished by God. How many of you know that? If a pastor goes renegade, God's going to get him, and you know that. So why can't we see that our disobedience against a God-given pastor will also be judged by God? If God is going to judge the pastor, why can't we see God will judge me? If I renegade against the pastor, if I'm talking down the pastor, if I'm running down the doctrine, the pastor's preaching from the pulpit, God is going to nail me. And why can't we see that? We can see that a pastor that runs off with some other girl is going to get judged by God. But we can't see that the God's, if he's God's man, he's God's man. If God's good, do you see the logic in this? If he's God's man enough that you can see that, that he's going to be judged if he brings heresy, then aren't you going to be judged if he doesn't bring heresy and you don't obey it? Do you see the simple logic in this? This is killing, 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 killing our country. You can't have a church without a pastor. You cannot. You say, yes, we can. You're a liar. God ordained pastors. He put them in the Word of God. God set this thing up. A church without a pastor is non-functional. It has to have a pastor before it can go forward. It might be in limbo for a while, but it's got to have a pastor. Got to. This is how God works. He works through ordained authority. You say, oh, well, we just home church over here and everybody brings a word. That ain't no church. That is not a church. God works through authority. God leads through authority. God raises up authority. And God ordains the authority. God places the authority. And God holds you responsible if you disobey the authority. When I moved here... I've never told this to anybody out here. I don't think maybe one or two. I wore shorts all the time, Brother Reggie. I have camo cargo shorts, leather flip flops, and a backward baseball cap. You'd all fall over dead. (laughs) My daddy preached differently on those subjects. Okay? When I moved here, I heard Pastor Reggie preach about men wearing shorts. Brother Reggie, I don't necessarily see it exactly eye to eye. Have you ever seen me in shorts? You know, we won't. You ask my kids if they've seen me in shorts in my house since I came here. Have you seen me in shorts since I came here? No. When the pastor preaches, you have three basic options. Obey, appeal, or rebel. That's it. Three basic options. You can obey, you can appeal, or you can rebel. We all know pastors make mistakes. All of us know that. If the pastor starts preaching against orange marmalade, then the men of the church can gather and go to Pastor Edgy and say, Pastor, we don't see that. in the you, right, We're not getting into dealing with that kind of stuff. God expects us to obey. When pastor deals with issues... I'm just going to throw some out that I've heard him preaching about. Women wearing pants. He preached about it. What are you going to do about it? You're going to rebel against the God-given authority who has given Scripture and said it? Are you going to appeal or are you going to obey? Country Western music preaches against it. What are you going to do? Oh, I don't see it that way. And you just keep coming. Here's Here's the crazy thing. So I think, well, I'm the head of my home, Brother Reg, so with all due respect, I won't wear shorts in your church house because, you know, you're the pastor here. But when I get home, here they go. And when I go to the vacation, here they go. And I'm going to do what I want to do. And every man does what is right in his own eyes. And what I'm doing is total hypocrisy. Putting on a show at church, acting like I'm something that I'm not. So that I can appease the pastor or just get by. Listen, God is serious about this stuff. I'm not trying to beat you all at all. I'm one of you. And I'm going to have issues, I promise you. This is one of the reasons I didn't want to preach this. Because pastor's going to say something next that hits me. That's how this works. And I'm aware of that. That's coming for me. I know that. 
And it's, and listen, you say, I'm the head of my house. Listen, disobedience is, this, is sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. This has nothing to do with pastor's skill. It has nothing to do with whether or not you like him. It has nothing to do with whether or not you see eye to eye. It has everything to do with God-given, God-ordained authority. Are you going to obey? If not, you will leave the church. And not because he runs you out or anybody else does. You will blow out. If you do not follow the God-given authority, you will not last. Eventually, it will grow. It will grow. It will grow. The rift will grow bigger and bigger. The hypocrisies, the backbiting, you'll form little cliques that kind of come over here. And what we're, we ladies, we're going to wear our britches together over here. We're going to go put on our skirts over here at church. And we guys, we're going to go wear our shorts over here. And then when we get to church, we're going to put on our pants over here. And we've got these little cliques forming and everybody knows who kind of agrees with this and who kind of agrees with that. And it will fracture the church church it destroys unity it destroys what god is doing in the church he says that you're all to be of one mind that you're all to speak the same thing how can you do that by trusting the god-given authority you say brother burks why did you put your shorts away and not get them back out because i chose to yield my right of how I think I see things in the Bible because I did not want to make an issue out of something that didn't matter. So I put them away. That's your option. You can do that. What's more important, the work of God, the advancement of the gospel, or your stinking shorts? I'm not perfect in this thing. Okay, I'm not coming at you like I'm better than you because I'm not. And there will be things that hit me that I've got to deal with. And I could be, I'd be honest, Brother Reg knows there already are. Because we've had conversations about things. I've had to come to you before, haven't I? Well, praise God, he forgot. <laughs> I've had to come to him before and talk to him about some of these things. And say, Brother Reg, you said this, but what, you know, work it out. You've got three options, obey, appeal, or sin. This is why God cannot bless our churches. Why God can't bless our families. God is serious about this. The rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Can two walk together except they be agreed? As I'm closing up here, Saul, whenever he disobeyed, he got an evil spirit from the Lord. When we disobey the man of God and will not do what he tells us from the word of God to do. I'm not talking about being cult followers. Okay, you know that. I said you can appeal. But when you will not do what the man of God says, when you will not submit to his Bible teaching, he gets up here and teaches the word of God and you say, I don't see it that way. You get home at the dinner table and you say, all right, everybody, listen up. Brother Reg, he's wrong about this and he's wrong about that and he's wrong about this. You are bringing devils into your home. You will destroy your posterity. And then the wife, she gets up, she goes, well, I, I, don't want, I don't like what he said about that. I'm not going to do that. And she starts pushing on the husband, pushing on the husband, pushing on the husband to get him to do something else. She's bringing devils into the home. Did you know that the, the people who blow out in church are usually the best families? I've been a pastor's kid. Now I'm not. My dad's dead. But I was a pastor's kid for 25 years. Now I go to another church where I'm under Pastor Reg. And so for most of my life, I've been heavily involved in church. I've got 30 years of church experience, okay? Take it or leave it. Sitting in church meetings from a little baby and on up. And I have seen over and over and over again, it's the best families, the best people. They get a bird in their saddle about something stupid. A movie they like, music they like. Oh, my son's hair is too long and the pastor preached about it. It's a shame for a man to have long hair, the Bible says. Pastors preached about it. They get a little burr in their saddle about something stupid. And it's just a matter of time. Usually, they take out a large group with them. Because the best families usually have a wider sphere of influence in the church. And when they finally pop, they do extreme damage to the church. The Bible says, obey them that have the rule. Obey! Obey! 
Submit, submit, obey. That's not a nice word, but it's in the Bible. And you can see it with the dad over the children. You can see it with the government over the person that's supposed to obey the law. Why can't we see it over God's ordained authority in the church? Better see it or you'll destroy your family. Pastor Rich.